Next on Mugshots, George Rivas, the leader of the Texas Seven. People like the guy, they lowered their guard around him, and when he's ready, he strikes. He staged a daring prison break and led a gang of seven fugitives on a journey that triggered a national manhunt. He was the mastermind, he helped plan it, he helped execute it, a sort of Pied Piper of criminals. Rivas is the smartest criminal I've dealt with. He's dangerous because he is so smart. Drevis's behavior pattern shows that he does not mind taking violent action. George Rivas is the type of guy that's just having a great time right now knowing I outsmarted you. I oh, vow to myself, I'm not going to die an old man in prison. December 13th, 2000, Connolly Prison, a maximum security facility with over 2,500 inmates in Southeast Texas. Officials at Connolly are unaware that a group of prisoners are planning an escape, an escape that would earn them a place in Texas folklore. Larry Harper, 37, serving a 50-year sentence for raping three women. Donald Newberry, 38, serving a 99-year sentence for armed robbery. Patrick Murphy, 39, serving a 50-year sentence for raping a woman during a robbery. Randy Halperin, 23, serving a 30-year sentence for beating his girlfriend's infant when the child wouldn't stop crying. Joseph Garcia, 29, serving a 50-year sentence for stabbing his friend 19 times during a drunken brawl. Michael Rodriguez, 38, serving a life sentence for hiring a hitman to kill his wife. And George Rivas, 30, serving 17 life sentences for robbery and kidnapping, and an additional life sentence for violating his probation. Rivas was considered a model prisoner and was classified as a trustee due to good behavior, a status that allowed him to work in the maintenance area of the prison and gave him special privileges. George Rivas was one of my first serious criminal cases that I took as a defense attorney. George Rivas always had that attitude, you won't hold me for 17 life sentences, you will not see me do 17 life. And he was proved correct. On a cold December morning, Rivas puts the plan into action. He and his men overpower guards, tie them up, steal their weapons, and drive a maintenance truck through the back gate to freedom. Rivas's plan worked perfectly. It was one of the biggest prison breaks in history. People made reference that this break was on par with the escape from Alcatraz. They were having lunch in a maintenance area, and they overpowered the guards that were, the civilian guards that were there, and they escaped with weapons in a marked prison vehicle. The Texas Seven flee with 14 handguns, a rifle, a shotgun, and 239 rounds of ammunition. They also took clothes, money, credit cards, and identification from the prison guards. When they escaped, prison guards discovered a note in the prison from the Texas Seven that said they hadn't heard the last of them yet. Every available law enforcement officer in the area is on the lookout for the stolen truck. Officers are stationed a thousand feet apart along the city's major highway. The car in and itself is what got him out of the pen, but once you're out, you need to get rid of it immediately. That's priority one. You need another car because you could not get too far in a government vehicle. Two hours after the breakout, police find the truck abandoned in a Walmart parking lot just three miles from the prison. Investigators believe Rivas and the other men were in this car, recorded leaving the scene by an ATM security camera. The officials believe they had help the moment they got out because they were able to completely disappear the moment they escaped. Many of the law enforcement people involved believed that they would actually go south and uh, head towards the, the Mexican border. Federal agents are alerted at the Mexican border. 
Information about the escapees is posted across the entire state of Texas. The hunt continues throughout that first night. Investigators begin to search the homes of the frightened residents. The next day, there is still no sign of the elusive fugitives, and the U.S. Marshals and the ATF are called in. The entire state of Texas is now on high alert. If you bust out of the pen, they'll bring every hound dog west of the Mississippi after you. The police department officers are on a higher state of awareness right now. We're taking serious every call that we respond to could be a potential run-in with an escapee. The cat and mouse game between Revis and the police had begun. While the city of El Paso is 600 miles west of the prison, it becomes a focus of the investigation. We immediately went on alert here. There is a probability that they could come to El Paso, uh, Revis being from El Paso. There are a lot of people here in El Paso that were victims, and uh, there were quite a few prosecutors that put George Revis in the position that he is today. And I think they're really afraid that he's going to come back and pay them, pay them back. Coming up on the border, one of the uh, main bridges that crosses from El Paso to War in Mexico. We have three bridges right here in El Paso. We can walk across them. You can drive across. George Rivas would have no problem getting into Mexico if he wanted to go to Mexico. That'd be the least of his difficulties. We hear about the rule of three days and three miles. That is to say, within three days of breaking out of prison within a three-mile radius, folks are generally caught. On their third day of freedom, George Rivas and the Texas 7 defy that rule. We're going to split up. And then uh, this is my fault. I, uh, what I'd always done, that's when I decided to uh, rob the store. 200 miles from the prison in a suburb of Houston, Revis and Donald Newberry enter a radio shack. They went into the store and rounded up the employees and some of the customers, took their possessions, their, their money, wallets, uh, credit cards, and so forth, bound them, put them in a back room, and when they completed that robbery, they left with a fair amount of cash, and they had a lot of equipment. They walk out with police scanners, radios, and walkie-talkies. Rivas took a bunch of equipment, communications devices, so that he could communicate with his accomplices. He was so organized, everything was so well-planned, and he had such a clear pattern to all his robberies. It was exactly Rivas's MO. Tell him what to do. Tell him, uh, go get the VCRs and camcorders. We need to sell these things to get money. They brought junk. I was kind of upset. The employees tell investigators that the robbers were considerate, giving back car keys and credit cards at the victim's request. The heavily armed Texas 7 had staged one of the biggest prison breaks in the history of Texas and a robbery without anyone getting seriously injured. A Texas legend was in the making. Seven guys got out of prison without any bloodshed. It's a curious circumstance, and uh, the fact that they haven't been caught immediately is also curious. So, so they're breaking records, and it's an interesting group of men. So naturally, the nation is uh, wondering who these guys are, you know, what their next step is going to be. I would certainly think the law enforcement don't want to think them as legendary, but uh, they're definitely making a name for themselves. With the entire state on high alert, people speculate whether the group is still together. George Rivas is an extremely convincing young man. Once he gets you out of the pen, you owe him. And I think that the other six kind of obligated to stick with him for a while. It speaks to Rivas' leadership abilities. He's got an enormous job, and that's keeping seven men in line as they attempt to survive the ordeal of being sought after by law enforcement day in and day out. 
Hundreds of tips are reported across the state, but police are no closer to finding Rivas and the Texas Seven. Two days after the Radio Shack robbery, the FBI joins the search. The cops have been searching nonstop. It was described to me as a law enforcement web, that they're everywhere, but somehow they're slipping through through the pieces of the web. George Rivas is not trying to get away and put all this behind us, because if he was, he'd be long gone. He has to do a couple more jobs. He has to taunt you before he heads for the border. George Rivas is the type of guy that's just having a great time right now knowing I outsmarted you. Coming up, what turned George Rivas into the most wanted man in the state of Texas? Next on Mugshots. Psychopathic personality or any social individuals are actually great salesmen. They're very likable, they're seductive, they're fun. Grievous seems to fall into that category. People like the guy, they lower their guard around him. He's able to size them up, he figures out what their vulnerabilities are, and when he's ready, he strikes. After robbing the Radio Shack near Houston, George Rivas and his fellow escapees continue to move around undetected. Meanwhile, in his hometown of El Paso, the local police are staking out his former haunts. They are also looking into his background for clues. You can look at his childhood. His mother and father had been having problems, and they divorced when he was at age six. He was basically raised by his grandparents. Train tracks parallel the street where he lived in the lower middle class neighborhood of Lower Valley. He grew up calling his grandmother mom and lived with her, his father, his younger sister, and three uncles. He suffered from asthma from the time he was four years old, but was an otherwise healthy child. He really didn't get into any trouble during high school, during his high school years. That made him pass through those years an unremarkable character. From about my teen years to my early adulthood, I lied through the skin of my teeth. What his classmates didn't know was that Rivas was already committing petty crimes. He snuck money out of a cash register from a local store. He shoplifted socks and underwear, but soon his crimes escalated. George Rivas started his criminal career, according to court records, a year before he graduated from high school. He robbed a Pela store here in El Paso. He had worked there apparently a, a year prior to, to robbing the place. He was, I think, just several months shy of, of turning 17 at the time. He went in with a partner. He tied up the employees, put them in the back room, supposedly ripped out the phones from the wall, and grabbed the money and ran. Ten months later, he went back and successfully robbed the same store again. But two weeks afterwards, Revis was caught trying to break into a private residence. I took a probation the summer of 89. Uh, That's the one that scared me. Reva stayed straight for three years until something unexpected happened. The Payless robbery caught up with him. The victim of that crime went into an auto shack and recognized George as the guy that had held him up. He posted bail, and legal motions delayed his trial for over two years. In the meantime, he fathered two children by two different women. And he was taking classes in civil engineering at the University of Texas, El Paso. In the summer of 1992, he married. Three days later, he went on trial. George Rivas was extremely confident, which I remember put a lot of pressure on me because the evidence was there. There was, there was more than enough evidence to convict him, but he had a very cavalier attitude throughout the whole trial. I didn't do it. Frequently exchanged sneers at, at the detectives. When we look at antisocial individuals, part of what they're doing, and Rivas is no different, is empowering themselves. And in a sense, they're always snickering at their victim. They, they, they're finding a way to manipulate and to take advantage of the person whom they're having contact with. He was adamant this is a case of mistaken identity. I would never do anything like that. And the jury bought it. The trial ended in a hung jury. Rivas was 22 years old, newly married, and working towards a college degree. The plain truth, I was very greedy. At this point, George Rivas embarked on an eight-month crime spree throughout the Southwest. He became involved in several armed robbery incidents, and the robberies all unfolded the same way. 
He didn't get himself into anything that uh, he didn't know. He studied before he acted. Rivas is the smartest criminal I've dealt with. He's dangerous because he is so smart. Rivas developed a successful strategy for robbing large stores. He would pose as a security guard, lure the employees in one room, and trap them. So we knew after each and every one of these robberies that we had a same individual or group of individuals committing them, but we did not know who was committing them until the Toys R Us robbery. George Rivas and his two accomplices went into the Westside Toys R Us store supposedly to interrogate an employee who had been stealing. But something goes wrong. Someone called the police at some point and hung up the phone. And well, when you call 911 and you don't see anything, they call back. And George Rivas was standing next to one of the employees and she answered the phone and the operator said, how is everything? And the assistant manager said, no, everything's okay. And the operator was tipped off to the contradictory terms and sent out a police unit. After about two and a half to three hours worth of attempting to get them to negotiate with us, the SWAT team made a dynamic entry into the store and Rivas was taken into custody. He was charged with aggravated robbery, and because he had tied up the employees during the crime, he was also charged with kidnapping. His trial lasted a week. When George Reeves told the jury that he was actually one of the hostages and not one of the hostage takers, the jury laughed. They laughed out loud, and it was kind of a, a done deal at that point. This time, the jury came back with a guilty verdict, and Rivas was going to prison. Meanwhile, police had traced the handguns Rivas used back to an earlier robbery and linked Rivas with the theft of over 40 weapons from a local Oshman sporting goods store. He was intelligent and, and sly during the, the Oshman's trial. He had a response for everything. We got out evidence that his dogs were named Ruger and Beretta. And I think it was another thing that the jury considered when they presented evidence of the guy's fixation with, with weapons and just the danger that, that he presented. The jury found him guilty. 17 aggregate life sentences for robbery. To me, that was excessive. This is Texas. This is the Wild West, gunslingers, desperados, banditos, and the laws in the state of Texas are very harsh. There's nothing lenient here. The laws have been harsh from the beginning, and they still are today, and in this state, the law allows you to tack on one felony conviction and one felony indictment for each and every person in a robbery. So if you do a robbery and you take 17 people hostage, you're going to get 17 felony charges. The judge gave Rivas 17 life sentences and added an 18th life sentence for violating his earlier probation. George Rivas was 24 years old. Coming up. Rivas makes a break for freedom and adds a new crime to his list of offenses, murder. Next on Mugshots. By December 2000, George Rivas had been in the Texas prison system for over five years. His wife had divorced him, and with 18 life sentences, he had little hope of ever being released. From day one, in my opinion, George Rivas was thinking, sooner or later, someday, they're going to let their guard down, I'll see the opportunity, and I'm getting out of here. The typical prisoner is not a, a Hannibal the cannibal. I don't think you find great genius among most prisoners. But every so often, you're going to find someone who's bright, who's calculating, who's able to sit on their emotions, who's able to subordinate uh, impulse, and for the greater good, or at least to achieve goals that they concoct, are able to really skillfully manage to pull something like this off. George Rivas arranged for his group to stay in the maintenance department during lunch. One supervisor agreed to oversee them. Phase one, the gang overtook their supervisor with an ax handle and a handmade knife. They stole his clothes, tied him up, gagged him and carried him to the electrical room. For the next hour and a half, the Texas 7 bound and gagged 14 employees and prisoners who were returning from lunch. Then the phone rang. Rivas answered it. 
To avoid arousing suspicion, he told one of his gang to impersonate their supervisor. The ploy worked. Phase two. Revis and three of the gang headed for the back gate, posing as employees hired to install video monitors. The remaining three stayed behind. Then, one of the hostages broke loose, but couldn't get out of the locked room. He pulled the fire alarm, but the responding officers detected nothing wrong. Phase three, Revis's group gained access to the gatehouse. Providing a distraction, the group back at the maintenance department made a series of well-timed phone calls to the guards at the gate. This distraction allowed Revis's group to subdue the officers, steal their guns, and open the gate. Phase four, the group back at the maintenance department took the white prison truck, picked up Revis and his group at the gate area, and the seven convicts drove to freedom. He was the mastermind. He helped plan it, he helped execute it, he helped bring these people along, a sort of Pied Piper of criminals. It's incredible that he would have been able to perhaps hand choose the fellows he was going to work with, keep them in line, make sure that uh, you know, whenever this plan was concocted, perhaps uh, months in advance, that people remained quiet, no one spilled to anybody, and was able to get himself and these guys out of prison and out into the community without any detection. Revis led the fugitives from city to city. Using the police scanners they stole from Radio Shack, they were able to track the police and avoid capture. After six days, they arrived in the Dallas area. They stopped there for one week. On Christmas Eve, Jane Hawkins was having dinner with her 29-year-old son, Officer Aubrey Hawkins, in a Dallas suburb. He left early to respond to a police call, reporting suspicious activity at the nearby Oshman Sporting Goods store. Officer Hawkins was about to come face to face with George Revis. The Oshman's robbery in Dallas was just like the Oshman's robbery that, that we tried. Apparently, they went in right before closing or at closing. Again, they rounded up the employees, uh, bound them, and uh, robbed the store. Revis and his crew collect over $70,000, at least 40 guns, and a shopping cart full of winter clothes and supplies. Someone was peering in the window and uh, saw that something wasn't right. So they called the police. They had stolen scanners from Radio Shack after their escape. And so I was told by the police that they heard Aubrey's voice say, I'm in the front and there's nothing here. I'm going to circle around to the back. George Rivas uh, was waiting for, for his partners. He saw Aubrey Hawkins pull up. And he asked the officer to raise his hands. Officer Hawkins didn't. That point, he fired a shot through the window, hitting him in one of his shoulders. Again, he wouldn't raise his hand, so he fired another shot, hitting him in another shoulder. And from there, the gunfire erupted. Revis and his gang opened fire on Officer Hawkins. Then, according to police, they load into their getaway vehicle and run over the officer's head before fleeing the scene. His backup came too late. The doorbell rang, and I said, who is it? And they said, it's the Irving police. And so I said, has something happened to Aubrey? And a very strident voice said, well, if you'll let us in, we'll tell you. And they didn't have to tell me, you know. They don't come to your door, you know. Having spent time with George Rivas, it's, I do not believe that he intentionally set out to kill a police officer. Unfortunately, he will not hesitate if it interferes with his plans. I felt like I was kind of being with Aubrey to go there to see what he saw. And um, there was windshield glass everywhere. And I was walking around, and I was picking it up. And honestly, I heard Aubrey say, OK, Mom, now come on. It certainly drives the law enforcement profession just a little bit harder to try to get these individuals because we know that there may be another officer out there who could become a victim. In the state of Texas, you kill a police officer, the great state of Texas will kill you. When Mugshots returns, Revis brings the fugitives and an arsenal of weapons to an unsuspecting small town in Colorado.
You have $70,000. You have weapons. Seven men trying to evade capture. It's a wild scene to imagine. What will happen next? They are very dangerous criminals. We knew this from the start, but now we, we know it. For 11 days, George Rivas and the Texas Seven had eluded the massive manhunt. But after the brutal slaying of Officer Hawkins, the stakes are raised. Before, you had seven guys who had kind of uh, skillfully walked out of jail and perhaps even attracted uh, some degree of admiration or amusement, you know, in the community. But once you've committed murder, and particularly uh, murdered a law enforcement person, uh, that spells big trouble. They all had lengthy prison sentences to start out with. They have killed a police officer. All of them have done enough time in the pen to know the state of Texas will execute them. They have absolutely nothing to lose in a shootout with police officers, absolutely nothing. After killing the officer in Dallas, the fugitives head west until they run into an unforeseen roadblock in Amarillo. It was a snowstorm. Just like any other traveler, they got caught in the snowstorm. They decided, you know what, let's go north to get to avoid the snowstorm and to find a place of safety, to find a place of haven. First, they went through Pueblo, which is south of Colorado Springs. Couldn't fit in well. They purchase a Jeep Cherokee and a 32-foot Pace Arrow motorhome. Then, they head into the mountains. 45 minutes west of Colorado Springs, a little bit smaller, sort of a a sleepy community that where people mind their own business. This is the farthest place from the minds of law enforcement. They arrive in Woodland Park on New Year's Day. I couldn't tell people I'm George Rivas from the Texas 7. These are my friends, just give us a chance. I couldn't tell them that. Pretty much standard as everybody. They told me they were traveling Christians uh, and uh, you know they were looking for a place to park their motor home for a week. Some of the people that lived there were, were somewhat or quite religious, actually. And one of them started attending Bible studies. It is he that hath made us and not ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. When the Texas Seven very first came, I invited them all to the Bible study. And, and Harper came in and explained, you know, each person is different in their own way. And, and uh, yeah, so them guys were doing their own thing. And Harper was just real glad to come on down. And he fit right in. And Rebus, he was a very nice, very well-spoken. Harper told me, basically, he was the leader of their little group, uh, and he was, uh, and Harper was kind of the finance guy in their group. He paid the rent. He's the one who uh, always had the money to pay stuff, Harper was, and, and Rebus, but it was Rebus's decision on what they would do. They changed their appearances uh, in, in, as part of blending into the, uh, the new community. They grew their hair out longer fashion beards and mustaches, bleached their hair, took a number of appearance changes. I remember George Rivas's yellow hair, and I thought how kind of funny it was, but actually one of the tenants asked me if I'd watch Ally McBeal, and there was a lawyer, I guess, uh, going through midlife crisis that had colored his hair yellow, and so I'm like, okay. As the escapees are settling in at the Coachlight RV park, the ATF and FBI file federal charges against them. Around this time, investigators believe Rivas dumps their getaway vehicle and buys a brown van. Their everyday activities were normal like anybody else's. They went to Safeway, they worked on their cars. They just did the everyday normal little stuff that's uh, not precious to us at all, but probably very precious to them. Hearing my employees and certain customers, they were here on the weekends and during the week. This is a Texas roadhouse. They may probably felt at home here. What I heard from a couple of customers, they were trying to pick up chicks at the bar. One customer here mentioned that uh, she had befriended them and they were going to church with her. Uh, and I guess they pulled it off pretty, pretty well. Uh, it, it sounded like the perfect cover to me. Any clues to their true identity are too small to recognize. One of the, they always drink Shiner beer here, too. And that's, that's a Texas beer from Shiner, Texas. 
That, that was one thing they were known to do. They didn't know the motorhome very well at all. Uh, they ran into one of my wires up the road and tore their antenna off, but they explained it off as brand new and it still had temporary sticker. Everything fell into place. I mean, every one of these guys knew this story inside and out, backwards and forwards. Meanwhile, a reward fund started after the killing of Officer Hawkins rises to half a million dollars. Hysterical sightings are reported all over the country, as far away as New York. But for three weeks, Revis and his men live as ordinary travelers in a small community. They felt like no one had recognized them. And uh, as one day turned into another, they felt more and more comfortable being there. They, they got overconfident. Coming up, the local Woodland Park police learn they have the heavily armed Texas 7 living in their town. The standoff, next on Mugshots. These guys became modern day outlaws. People were comparing them to, you know, the outlaws of days gone by. Each and every one of these individuals are nothing more than, than common criminals, criminals who have been prosecuted and convicted for some very heinous crimes. And they are nothing more than thugs. For five weeks, George Revis and the Texas 7 had eluded law enforcement. They had robbed two stores and murdered a policeman near Dallas and are now living in a campground in Colorado. I believe they would have eventually tried to leave the country. They were waiting, though, for the right time. They knew that people were watching for them. And by lying low in Colorado, I believe they would have eventually headed south if things hadn't turned out the way they did in Colorado. January 21st, a friend came to me, had just gone to church with Harper, and was like, I think this is the Texas 7. So we got onto America's Most Wanted website, and every picture that I scrolled up, I knew every guy. I mean, it was just absolute shock. We notified Texas first to confirm the identifiers. And before you know, we had um, more law enforcement in this office than we've seen in a long time. That evening, Sheriff Finn and a police sergeant drive an unmarked car to within 50 yards of the escaped convict's motor home. Looking at it when we exited, my sergeant informed me, he said, I feel this is a tactical nightmare to attempt this in the dark, number one, because they do have the high ground. There's no way that we can get above them, especially in the dark. So we came back to the office and we set up a loose perimeter. Then, more bad news for the sheriff. He receives a call from the surveillance team. One of the cars that the seven owned was missing. With some of the group unaccounted for, the situation becomes more complicated. By morning, all law enforcement teams are in place. Sheriff Fenn drives his own motorhome, dubbed the Trojan Horse for this mission, into the campground. Four members of the FBI tactical unit are concealed inside the RV. I took the plates off, put a set of Utah license plates on it to make myself appear as if I'm a tourist checking into the campground. They knew Harper, who locals called the preacher, routinely came out for coffee in the morning. The FBI agents plan to jump him when he emerges. He hadn't come down for coffee. Sheriff Finn and the SWAT teams were all in place. We had SWAT teams in the building, on the hill, on the mountain, located all over the place. And, uh, and he didn't come down for coffee. The FBI decides to send the campground owner to investigate the situation. I drove around to each trailer, telling them all we were running out of water. They didn't know, but I actually wanted to see who was home, who wasn't home, who, who you know, to let the SWAT team know who, who they need to get out or who they need to protect, and then got up to Site 17, where the Texas 7 were. Revis came out. We had a lengthy conversation. I rubbed on the windows looking for guns. Unaware that he is surrounded by police, Revis tells Holder that he and two others were planning on driving to a neighboring town to pick up auto parts. Holder reports the information to Sheriff Fenn and the FBI. At about 10 o'clock in the morning, three subjects left the campground in a vehicle. The units on the highway were notified that they had left. Revis, Garcia, and Rodriguez are driving the Cherokee. The agents follow them as they pull into a gas station. 
Then, the SWAT team makes their move. They moved in from every direction, ordered them out of their cars, throw their weapons down. Rivas is in the driver's seat with three handguns strapped to his body and his foot on the gas pedal. A split second went through my mind saying, I got this gun here. No. The standoff lasts only seconds, and George Rivas surrenders without a fight. It was a good thing because had that not happened that way, uh, there would have been a lot of bloodshed. 40 days after leading a daring prison break, Rivas is back behind bars. Meanwhile, four of the Texas Seven are still free, and the scene shifts back to the campground. Within minutes, the whole hillside here moved in on the motorhome. After a short period of time, Mr. Halperin came out, surrendered himself, and was taken into custody. Randy Halperin tells the agents that Larry Harper is still inside, armed with rifles, handguns, shotguns, and a cache of ammunition. Halperin delivered a message, basically a verbal message, that Harper wanted to call his father uh, before uh, giving himself up. And this was being negotiated, but in the interim, a gunshot was heard from inside the RV. A few minutes later, there was another gunshot. We continued to negotiate, and after about two hours, with no response, the FBI uh, shot tear gas into the motorhome. Entry was made, and Mr. Um, Harper was found deceased on the floor of the motorhome. Larry Harper had two gunshot wounds to the chest. After searching the RV, agents recover $10,000 in cash, thousands of rounds of ammunition, and 35 weapons, all loaded and ready to fire. But Newberry and Murphy were still missing. After interrogating the captured fugitives, police learn that the two remaining fugitives may be 20 miles south in Colorado Springs. They alert the media. It was unusual enough that they came to Colorado, and now, they're in your own backyard, and it's frightened the hell out of a lot of people. The following evening, Singer is told by investigators that Newberry and Murphy had checked into a Holiday Inn. The desk clerk recognized them and called the police, who arrived and surrounded the hotel. Armed with 10 handguns and two shotguns, the convicts demanded to speak to the media. Who would think that they would ask for a television newscast or a journalist to try to get them out of the Holiday Inn you can imagine how nervous I was. Agents negotiated a surrender in exchange for a 10-minute interview. Hello? All righty, hello. Uh, we have on the line, uh, this is Eric Singer. Patrick Murphy. OK, Patrick, please go ahead. Yes, basically what I want to say here is why men like myself decide to do what we have done here, OK? Penal institution and the way Texas has things set up, I felt that I would eventually become an outlaw again anyway. I received 99 years for a robbery that nobody's injured. I've done crime, got a face to music, but they're giving kids so much time that they will never get to see light again. All right, Donald, as honorable men, you must go outside immediately without weapons. I want to put the phone down, take my shirt off, come out. Later I learned, several hours before, they were still considering doing a Butch Cassidy and the Sundance ending. George Rivas is behind bars in a Colorado County jail as the last of his gang surrender. The flight of the Texas Seven comes to an end. With Larry Harper in the morgue, the remaining six are extradited to Texas. George Rivas' demeanor was dominant. He wanted everybody to know who he was and what he was. Coming up, George Rivas goes to trial and faces the death penalty. Next on Mugshots. thankful that everybody cooperated with each other. Each agency was given an assignment. Each agency handled that assignment, and the conclusion was successful. Ten days after the Texas Seven were tracked down, U.S. Marshals bring George Rivas to a Dallas jail. On August 13, 2001, he goes on trial for killing Officer Hawkins. Eight days later, he is convicted of capital murder. At the sentencing hearing, he is given the opportunity to speak. 
I've seen the old men in prison who've been there so long that that's all they know. And I vowed to myself last year, I'm not going to die an old man in prison. Revis testifies for two days. On the stand, Revis is asked about his role in the death of Officer Hawkins. It's my fault. Uh, to this very day, even now, I still feel responsible completely for his death. Prosecutors use an exhibit to show the trajectories of the 11 bullets that killed Officer Hawkins. Were you trying to kill Aubrey Hawkins? God, no, no. But then your friends must have been trying to kill Aubrey Hawkins. I can't tell you what they were thinking, sir. Looking at this exhibit, you don't think the medical examiner lied about where he found the wounds, do you? No. Someone was obviously trying to kill Aubrey Hawkins, weren't they? There's a way, sir, I take responsibility. Someone was trying to kill Aubrey Hawkins, weren't they? I take responsibility, sir. Revis admits that towards the end, the group was falling apart. He suggests that the killing of Officer Hawkins was a factor. What were your plans up in Colorado? Look, I'm not going to blame my friends for anything. I take full responsibility, but I wasn't happy with what happened. And uh, that's why two of the guys were separated from us when we uh, got caught. When Revis was captured, he surrendered without a fight. But in the courtroom, he describes the tense moment when the arresting officer approached his Jeep. He leaned right across my gun. Never even knew I had it there. Did you tell him that you were armed? Oh, I told him. I told him, uh, I told him first. I said, uh, I got a gun on you. And he looked down. And uh, he used some kind of vulgarity about don't, don't think it, don't something like that. I mean, I'm not going to lie. A split second went through my mind, saying, I got this gun here. The officer, it's in front with the M16 or AR-15, I don't know which, he can't fire because I got this, his partner as a shield. And, uh, no. Before finishing his testimony, Revis addresses his fate. I don't want to just exist anymore like an animal in prison, so. What? You call the death penalty, I call freedom. Dan, please, sir. After plotting and pulling off so many crimes, it seemed George Revis's fate was also in his control. Please go with the sheriff. On August 29, 2001, George Revis is sentenced to die by lethal injection. They got a burst of freedom there for a while. I don't know if it was worth it. I found myself at times wondering, uh, is this guy really that bad of a guy? Uh, he's so intelligent, he's so articulate. But then my thoughts keep turning back to what he did and the others did to Officer Aubrey Hawkins. And that kind of tells me that if you're gonna have remorse, you need to show some restraint and the killing of Aubrey Hawkins was definitely one of overkill. And any time I think back on that, the thoughts of you know, him showing remorse quickly leave. George Revis had the ability to, to become a very productive citizen, to get a good job, raise a family, become a productive member of society. George Revis had all that going for him. Unfortunately, he had that criminal touch to him, where he, that, that, that thrill of a robbery. And unfortunately, he couldn't control those urges, and this is what happened.